Right before Maghrib, we had Sheikh Sa'ad Taslim uh, start out our discussion that we're having tonight on the topic of the day of signs of the day of judgment. And now we will have our visiting scholar, Sheikh Dr. Ahsan Hani from Birmingham, UK, not Alabama, as uh, Sheikh Sa'ad mentioned earlier. Sheikh uh, Ahsan Hanif is uh, a graduate from the University of Medina, where he did his bachelor's in Sharia, and he later finished his uh, PhD at the uh, University of Birmingham. And uh, Sheikh Ahsan is a Imam and Khatib of Green Day Masjid in his local city, and we are very, very honored to have him here in, in the U.S. during his first trip. And without further ado, for the Hello. Hello. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيد رب الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن صار على سبيله ونهجه لا يوم الدين سلم تسليم كثيرا أما بعد First of all I'd like to um, thank and praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى was allowed to gather and unite here in this masjid from one of the many houses of Allah سبحانه وتعالى across this earth and that we have united, inshallah ta'ala, sincerely for his sake, Jalla fi ula, and we only come and we only gather and we only sit, and we only visit with one another for his sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And without that, this is one of the greatest blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can ever bestow upon any group of people, that they can learn their religion and they can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by learning their religion. And whenever I visit a new community or I come to such a gathering, whether in a masjid or a university, or some other type of function, it always reminds me um, of the statement of Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, one of the famous scholars of the past. He would say that it is from the greatest blessings of Allah that you are guided to those who will teach you your religion. And sometimes it's a blessing that we take for granted. And if we cast our minds back some 1400 odd years ago, there was a time when the Muslims were few in number, and they were weak and they were oppressed, and they were from the lower levels of their society. And they were oppressed simply because they said La ilaha illallah. Nothing more, nothing else, nothing major. Simply because they came with this one single statement. La ilaha illallah. And the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would often come to him in those early Muslim years and they would complain of the persecution and the torture and the oppression and the difficulty that they were facing. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would advise them with patience. And he would tell them of the struggles of the nations who came before them. And then he would prophesize that a time would come when there would scarce be a house or a place on the whole planet except that the people would have heard of La ilaha illallah. And some 1400 years later, me and you, we are witnesses to this prophecy. We see its realization and how truthful it is in our time. And me and myself and Sheikh Sa'ad, I think we are both witnesses to this. When we were students in the Islamic University of Medina, we had students from places that I would never imagine that there were Muslims living there, let alone students, and there were places, students from places that I never heard of. We had students from places like Argentina, and Brazil, and Uruguay, and all of these exotic countries, which I didn't think there were many Muslims there. We had Muslims from South Korea, places like that where I didn't even know you had Muslim communities. And then you had students from places like the Comoros Island, Juzur al Qama, which I had never heard of in my life, and I still am very unsure of where it is on a map. But it's somewhere, and they were students from there. And they came from these places from far and wide, so that they could learn their religion, and they could go back, and they could teach their people. It is from the universal laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has established in our religion, that from every community there should be a group of people who go out and study and they learn their religion so that they can benefit their community. And so it is amazing that you have in Washington, D.C., um, the most powerful city in the world, or so they keep telling me. Uh, and this brings to mind uh, the famous statement of, uh, this is a tangent now, but anyway, this is a, a famous statement of Imam Shafi'i, uh, who's originally from Mecca, but he spent many years in Baghdad. And then he left Baghdad and he went and he settled in Egypt and that's where he died, rahimahullah ta'ala. They would say to him, why do you like Baghdad so much? He would reminisce about his days in Baghdad. And he would say, ma ra'ad dunya man lam yara Baghdad. You haven't seen the world until you've seen Baghdad. That's what people say now about Washington. You haven't seen the world until you've seen Washington or the state. So anyway,
So uh, that's completely off topic. But uh, so I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has given us this ability to sit with one another. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have people in your community like Sheikh Saad and others who um, will benefit you and give you guidance as well. Our topic this evening is concerning uh, some of the signs of Yom Al-Qiyam and I understand that Sheikh Saad he spoke before the Salah about the importance of, of learning and extrapolating benefits from the signs of Yom Al-Qiyam. One of the things that you find when you study the signs of Yom Al-Qiyam as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us to do in the Quran when he says فَهَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا السَّاعَةَ أَنْ تَأْتِيَهُمْ بَغْدًا فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاطُهَا فَأَنَّا لَهُمْ إِذَا جَاءَتْهُمْ بِكْرَامٍ Do the people wait for the sun, for the, for the hour to strike them unexpectedly but rather we have sent for them many signs, many portents so that they can be reminded of its arrival, of its forthcoming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to seek reminder from Ashraq al-Sa'a. And one of the ways that we do this is we look at the dozens upon dozens of Ashraq, signs that are mentioned in the Sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we look for undercurring themes and patterns within them. The signs of Yawm al-Qiyamah are split into categories. There are signs which have passed, signs which are all around us today, and signs which will come in the future, haven't yet come during our time. These signs of Yom al qiyam in whichever category they are in, you will find that they have a similar theme running through. So for example, you have signs concerning knowledge, signs that have passed, signs that are all around us today, signs that are coming in the future. You have signs that only speak about acts of worship, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, some of them have passed, some of them are around us, some of them will come in the future. Signs about wealth, signs about power and leadership, signs about social issues, the different way that society is going to change over time. And again, these are signs, some of them have passed, some are around us today, and some of them will be coming in the future. And one of the things that it is important for us to do is to look at those underlying themes, how things will change over time. Because it is a prophecy of the Prophet wasallam that people will change, their Islam will change, their society around them will change their relationship with materialism will change, with their possessions will change. And so the Muslim is the one who looks at these themes, he looks at what the Prophet ﷺ is informing him of, and then he takes heed, he takes benefits from this. And so I want to go through some of these themes this evening, and just to extrapolate some benefits from this, and then to discuss some of how this will go and translate into the major signs of Yom Al-Qiyam. We take the example of, of um, knowledge, and I know Shaksa had spoke a little bit about this before, but I'm going to probably repeat some of what he's already said. But when we look at the theme of knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ prophesied many signs revolving around the single principle. If you were to look at knowledge in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, in the time of the Sahaba, in the time of the early scholars of Islam, knowledge was something sacred amongst the Ummah. There was something which their children which children aspired to, and which parents wished for their children. Like now you have children, and like you know, depending on which community you come from, your parents want you to be a doctor, like an engineer, an accountant, maybe a lawyer. In those times, parents wanted their children to be scholars, to memorize the Quran, to memorize the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, to understand the religion of Allah Azzawajal, to the extent that it's reported on Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah that his mother even sold some of her property. So her son could go and he could study. It's reported on the mother of Imam Malik rahimahullah, that she would take her son when he was a young boy and she would take him to his first teacher, Rabi'at al-Ra'i. And she would say to her son, Idhab ila Rabi'ah, fakhud min adabihi qabla ilmi. Go to your teacher Rabi'ah and learn from his manners before you learn from his knowledge. This is how people were. And the mother of Imam al-Shafi'i, the mother of Imam Malik, they weren't great scholars. They weren't anyone special. It's not like they were the you know, the Sahaba or anything, these were just Muslim women, Muslim families, Muslim children. But this is the way that they aspire, to learn about Islam. And this continued as they grew up, the attachment that they had for knowledge. And Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, is an example of this. When Imam al-Bukhari was young, he was blind. And it was his mother's dua, she made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah would return his eyesight. And so Allah azza wa accepted her dua and his eyesight returned to him. And Imam al-Bukhari became one of the greatest scholars of hadith, Amir al-Minin al-Hadith. It is said that he was once traveling on a ship, 
And as he was traveling on the ship, he struck up a conversation with another man on the ship. And this man noticed that Imam al-Bukhari had in his possession a bag of gold plates, a lot of wealth in that time. So as they were talking and as they were having this discussion, this man, his eye, his mind was constantly wandering to this bag of gold. So when they finished their conversation, this man, he went to the other side of the ship, to where his own place on the ship was, and he began to scream and shout, someone stolen my gold, someone stolen my money, there's a thief on board. And so the people obviously go into a panic. Everyone searching the ship, they're searching people, their possessions, they're looking for this bag of gold. And they search Imam al-Bukhari, and they search everyone else, and they search the whole ship. But there's no bag of gold coins to be found. So after everyone settles down, everyone goes back to their own business, this man he returns to Imam al-Bukhari, and he says to him, where's the bag of gold coins? This bag of gold coins that I saw in your possession, where is it from? Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah replied and he said, when we began to scream and shout about the lost gold, I took it and threw it into the ocean. I took it and threw it into the ocean. The man said, you're crazy. Why would you throw a bag of gold coins into the middle of the ocean? You've lost it. It's never going to return. Why didn't you just let people take it from you and give it back to me? Just give it to me. Why throw it away? No one benefits like this. So Imam al-Bukhari said, because I narrate the hadith of the Prophet And if the people thought that I was a thief, that I was a liar, that I was treacherous, that I was dishonest, that I was a man of bad character, then they wouldn't accept the hadith from me. And by Allah, a single hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is more beloved to me than all of the gold of the dunya. All of the gold of the dunya. A single hadith. What is a single hadith? A single hadith can be a line, two lines, three lines, a statement, a few words. The shortest hadith are four or five words. A single hadith is more beloved to me than all of the gold of the dunya. This is the way that Islam began. This was the attachment that people had towards knowledge. And there are countless stories that I can give you, countless stories that I don't know concerning this single issue. Yet over time what will happen is we will lose our attachment to knowledge. And is it because we're no longer able? Is it because we no longer have the ability, we no longer have the, um, you know, the, the intelligence, we no longer have the time, we no longer have the means? No. In fact, it is the opposite. Because one of the things that the Prophet said from the signs of Yawm al he said, Inna bayna yadayi sa'a, indeed before the hour strikes, and he mentioned a number of signs. And then he said, Kathratul jahl wa al qalam. There will be much ignorance that will prevail, but the people will be more educated and literate. Look at those two signs. And look at how they are contradictory. The people will be ignorant, ignorance will prevail, but the people will also be more educated. The whole al means they're more literate, they're more educated, they're more qualified. And if you were to look at us, right, like most of us, inshallah ta'ala, especially the younger ones from amongst us, we compare ourselves to our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. Are we not more educated? Don't we have higher qualifications? Don't we have like more PhDs and master degrees and all of these qualifications that our parents and grandparents probably never even had the opportunity to, to study and to take. Yet at the same time you will find that ignorance is increasing also amongst the Muslim community. Why? Because the Prophet is saying you have more means, you have more capability. But the problem is that your attachment to the religion is decreasing. And so your, your increase in literacy and education is in everything else except Islam. And in Islam you increase in ignorance. And this is one of the trends that we see, and there are so many signs that go around it. So many signs that revolve around a single one theme of people increasing in literacy, but at the same time decreasing in Islamic knowledge. If you look at our times now, it is probably far easier to study Islam than it's ever been in the past. In the past, if you wanted to learn your religion, you had to travel on camelback, donkey, horse, or sometimes walking from one country to another, a month's trip, just to go and see one scholar. And then you'd probably spend months in his company. And then you'd move on and you'd go to another scholar. And you can't like keep everything on an iPhone or an iPad. You have to write scrolls upon scrolls, books upon books. Now you have to find camels and horses to carry those books. And then you go to the next scholar. 
and the third scholar. And it's reported that even some of the companions would travel a month for a single hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yet they had that attachment and enthusiasm. Now you have the internet, right? You have Google, check Google. You have everything at the tips of your fingers. YouTube, right? The whole world has opened up for you. You can store so much on a small phone, on an iPad, on a tablet, anything. You can have thousands upon thousands of books, hundreds upon hundreds of lectures stored on a single device. Something which people before you could never even dream or imagine. But at the same time, even though we have more capability, we are losing our religion. Losing it in terms of knowledge and losing it in terms of worship. And that's why the Prophet wasallam prophesied that from the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, is that a time will come when the people will no longer recognize Salah. When we just pray, Maghrib, Rishah, Fajr, people will no longer recognize the prayer. They will not recognize zakat. They will not recognize fasting. They will not recognize hajj. They won't know what these things are. And the only people that will have some semblance of their religion are the elder, the sheikh al-kabir, the old man, wal mar'at al-ujuza, the old woman. And they will say that indeed we used to hear our forefathers say, la ilaha illallah. So we too say this thing. Isn't this exactly what the mushrikeen of Quraysh used to say? That this is something that our forefathers taught us. We don't know what it means. We don't know why we worship these idols. We don't know what the significance is. But our forefathers used to do this. And we will follow them. We will follow in their footsteps. So likewise, the time will come when the Muslims will say this. That we don't know what la ilaha illallah is. We don't know what fasting is. We don't know what prayer is. But we remember that our forefathers used to say this. And so we too now say la ilaha illallah. And that's why when you look at how things change over time, and there are so many signs on knowledge and worship, the Prophet ﷺ prophesied so many things to show us how we're going to become detached from our religion, how we will lose knowledge, how we will lose the understanding of our religion. And that's why the Prophet said وسلم, that one of the ways that this would happen is that Allah won't take knowledge from you by snatching it away, but it will be with the deaths of the scholars. Because when the scholars die, they won't be those people who will replace them of a sufficient caliber, of those people who have sufficient knowledge. And so every generation that passes, a piece of Islam passes with it. There are some narrations that say that the first thing that the people will lose is the knowledge of inheritance, the knowledge of Farah. You don't know how you distribute your inheritance. And today, if you go to many Muslims, they don't know what the, what the science of inheritance is. What does my father get? What does my daughter get? What does my son get? What does my wife or my husband receive? I don't know. And so we're losing our religion piece by piece. And so one of the things that we take from studying the science of Yom Al-Qiyamah is when you realize there's a trend, for me and you, we try to block this trend. There is a trend, it's going to happen, the Prophet ﷺ prophesied it. Eventually it's going to happen, it's the decree of Allah But that doesn't mean that me and you have to be part of this trend. We can work on our sound and our families, and our children, and our communities, to the best of our ability, so that at least we safeguard ourselves from this. From those trends that we see within the Shrat al is that of wealth. People's attachment to wealth. People become so materialistic. I mean, you know the famous hadith, the famous science of Yom al that people will compete in the construction of poor buildings, that people will become miserly and stingy, even though it is also from the signs of the hour, that Allah will open up the dunya, meaning that the Muslims will become extremely prosperous. And at the same time, the problem isn't money. Having money isn't the problem. The problem is our attachment to wealth. Why? Because before in the time of the Prophet وسلم, the companions weren't controlled by wealth. They controlled their wealth. They were the masters of their money. They never allowed material possessions to control them. And that's why if the Prophet وسلم, stood up, and he said to the companions, I need sadaqah, I need you to donate. They would all donate, without any exception. The women would give their jewelry, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would give everything he owned, Umar radiallahu anhu would give half of his wealth, Rasman radiallahu anhu would give so much that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to him, ma darra Uthman ma fa'ala ba'da al-yawm. Nothing will harm Uthman after today, because of so much sadaqah that he gave. Every companion would give, even the poorest amongst them, those who had no money, no possessions, no wealth, they would go to the marketplace 
and they would go to the wealthier companions who were buying goods. And they would say to them, why don't you allow us to take these goods, carry them on your behalf, and take them home. And so they would carry them home. And in return, all they would get is a handful of dates, or a handful of dried raisins. And they're poor. Their children are poor. Their wives are poor. They don't have any money. But they would take that handful of dates, and they would go to the Prophet ﷺ, and they would say, this is all we have. And they would give it to Sadaq. How amazing. Don't care about wealth. Don't care about the dunya. Not be occupied with money. Why? Because they understand that it's a means to a goal. Inna anzalna al-mal al-iqam al-salaa wa al-ita'i al-zakaa. The Prophet ﷺ said that only sent down so that the people would establish the prayer and they would give zakaa. It is a means to that end. It is not the goal and end itself. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-faqru aqsha alaykum. I don't fear for you poverty. What I fear for you is that the dunya will open up just as it opened up for those who came before you. And you will compete in it, just as those who came before you. And it will destroy you, just as it destroyed those who came before you. This is what's happening. When we become so preoccupied with money, that we don't care whether by hook or by crook, we just want money. We just want wealth. We want more and more and more. And nothing will satisfy us except death. We'll never stop. And at the same time, our children, we feed them with haram. And our wives, we feed them with haram. And we clothe them with haram. And the food and drink we have is haram. And everything is haram. And then when Allah Azza wa Jal sends upon us so many calamities and problems and tests, tests in our personal lives and with our families, we're like, why doesn't Allah have mercy on us? Why doesn't Allah respond to our du'as? Even though our whole life revolves around haram. And we're nourished upon haram. And this is one of the trends that we see towards global qiyamah. And that's why it is reported that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu during his khilafah, he was once eating. His, his, his um, custom or his uh, habit was that if his servant came with food, he would ask him first, where did the food come from? And then he would eat. But one day he was so busy in his khilafah, he was so preoccupied with his work, whatever he was doing, the food was bought and he began to eat. And as he was eating, he asked him, where did this food come from? So his servant said before Islam, I used to be a fortune teller. I would tell people's fortune. And many years later, now that I'm Muslim, I saw this man whose fortune I told before Islam, and it came true. So he gave me this food as a source of pain, as reward, appreciation. So I bought it for you. Abu Bakr radiallahu anh took his finger, he placed it down his throat, and he began to vomit. Forcibly vomit. And he continued to do this over and over again. The people around him said, Oh Abu Bakr, why are you doing this? Whatever you've eaten is gone. Okay, don't eat anymore. But whatever you ate already, it's okay, you didn't know. Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't hold you to account for your for what you don't know. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu replied, Indeed I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that that which is nourished upon haram, the fire of hell has more right to it. The fire of hell has more right to it. By Allah, if my soul was to leave, I would make every single morsel of this food leave my body. This is the way that the companions of Allah were. With simple issues of halal and haram of food and drink, let alone wealth and money, never allowed themselves to be controlled by these concepts. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu, known for their wealth at the times of their death, they had nothing. They didn't own anything. They didn't have any wealth, no property, no land, nothing to give to their children. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu on his deathbed, he called his children, he made them gather around him and he said, by Allah, your father had a choice between two things, either to leave you with no wealth and to look after the affairs of the ummah or to give you the dunya. And I chose to look after the affairs of the earth. He made this choice. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was extremely wealthy. By modern standards, a multi-millionaire, if not a billionaire. And he didn't care. Why? Because his relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal was so strong. It was more important to him. And so this is a trend that we also see. And so throughout the signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah, you see these many trends. Another trend is in social issues. Just the way that people treat each other. Just the way that we are as brothers and sisters. The way that we treat our neighbors and our families. The way that we even treat the animals. The way that we treat the environment around us. Social issues. It is from the signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah that people will no longer have respect for their parents. 
they will no longer have respect for one another. A person will kill their father and their brother and their neighbor is from the signs of Yawm al Even though these relationships in Islam are sacred. You don't kill your father, you don't kill your brother, you don't kill your neighbor, but people will do them. They will kill one, one another so much that the one who dies won't know why he was murdered. And the one who kills doesn't know why he killed him in the first place. Just killing indiscriminately. And the same with every single social issue. And people will make haram the halal. And make halal the haram. And everything will be twisted upside down. The treacherous will be considered honest. The honest treacherous. The trustworthy will be considered to be deceitful. The deceitful trustworthy. Those who should have power and leadership will not be given it. But those who don't deserve it will be raised. All of this will happen and it is from the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ didn't teach us this. This isn't the philosophy of Islam. This isn't the character of a Muslim. In the time of Abu Bakr when he first became the Khalifa. He had so many issues to deal with. People rebelling against him, people leaving Islam, false prophets, the Persians and the Romans attacking the Muslim lands. So Umar came one day to Abu Bakr and he said, Oh Abu Bakr, why don't you make me the judge of Medina? You deal with the issues of the Ummah, leave Medina to me, I will take care of Medina. So Abu Bakr agreed. And this is in the, the books of biography and in history. He agreed. For, and for one year, Umar was the judge and the governor of Medina. After one year, one day, he came back to Abu Bakr and he said, Oh Abu Bakr, I want to resign. I don't want to be the judge anymore. Abu Bakr was amazed. Right? Umar radiallahu anhu isn't the kind of guy who resigned. If you know the life of Umar and the character of Umar, he doesn't resign. So he said to him, Amin mashaqqatin hi. Is it because of the difficulty, the responsibility of the role that you want to resign? So Umar radiallahu anhu said no. He said, by Allah, I have been a judge for a whole year. And during that time, not a single case has come before. No two people have come before me with a single dispute. And then he went on and he said, Oh Abu Bakr, because we live in a community where every single person knows the rights that they have over others. So they don't go overboard in demanding their rights. And they know the rights of others upon them. So they don't fall short in delivering those rights, in fulfilling those rights. We are in a community that if one of us becomes ill, everyone goes and visits him. If one of us dies, they will follow his janazah. If one of them needs help financially, the people will run and rush to repay the debts of their fellow brothers and sisters. And so Abu, Abu Bakr, I don't want to resign because it's difficult. I resign simply because there's no need. This is the type of community. Imagine living in this way, living in such a community. And it's not because the companions never differed. They never had disagreements. They never had misunderstandings. They did even in the time of the Prophet But they knew how to solve it. They knew the rights of one another. If I'm in the wrong, I know. As a Muslim, I'm in the wrong. So therefore, okay, you're in the right. And vice versa. And so the Muslims knew they had this standard. But what would happen over time is things would change. Why? Because we are no longer connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our iman is weak. And instead of learning the foundations of Islam and building on those foundations, we become preoccupied with the mind machine. So preoccupied with issues that are not even important in our religion. Small issues that only the scholars should probably debate and discuss in the first place anyway. And so for us, because we're so involved in the mind of shame, our Imam becomes weak. And this is what we see as we go towards Yom al Qiyamah, that the people will lose touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why it culminates in the major trials. The major trials don't come before the minor trials. Why? Because the minor trials showed the mentality of the people changing. So by the time the major trials arrive, the people, the understanding of Islam will be so warped and it will be so deficient that the major trials can strike them and they don't know. They don't even know they're in a major trial. They don't even recognize what the Prophet ﷺ said, warning them of this major trial. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ say concerning one of the major trials, the trial of the Dajjal, that by Allah, there is not a single trial from the time of Adam until the end of time that is greater than the trial of the Dajjal. And another hadith, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was not a single prophet of Allah except that he warned his nation of the Dajjal lest he should come out amongst them. 
Yet at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ said, indeed from the signs that the Dajjal's time is approaching, is that the people forget to speak about him. And the Imam neglects to speak about him from the minbar. It's a sign that the Dajjal is approaching. We know this. We know that we should learn about the Dajjal. We know that we should teach our children about the Dajjal. We know that reciting Surah al Kahf saves you from the Dajjal, gives you protection from the Dajjal. But how many of us memorize, learn, read Surah al Kahf, understand it, internalize it? How many of us teach it to our children? And this is the way that things will happen. The Prophet said concerning the Dajjal that from the signs or from the, the physical appearance of the Dajjal is he will have the letters Kafara. Kafara written in between his two eyes on his forehead. The word Kafara means disbeliever. Kafara. And every literate or illiterate Muslim will read it. Every literate or illiterate Muslim will read it. Yet even so, even though it clearly says that he is a Kafir, even though the Prophet ﷺ said, know that the Dajjal is one eye, and your Lord is not one eye. Even though we have so many of these ahadith, the Muslims will go, many of them will go and follow. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, don't go out and seek the Dajjal. For by Allah, a person will go, thinking that he is strong in Iman, and he will return to disbelief. And the Prophet ﷺ said that a man will tie up his family members to the pillars and posts of his house, out of fear that they will go out for curiosity, just to look at the Dajjal. But when they go and they see the trials that he has been given, they will believe him. And the point of the Dajjal is that he is Allah. Not just a false prophet, not just a saint, not just a leader, he is Allah. And this, is, this goes against every single foundation and principle in Islam, that he could be Allah. Yet at the same time, people will go and they will believe. They will follow him also. Why? Because they lost that knowledge of the religion. And what really highlights this more beautifully than anything else is that in the time of the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, from all of the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he didn't give us more detail about any other sign except the Dajjal. You have signs, many signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, but they are just words. This will happen before Yawm Al-Qiyamah, before the Day of Judgment from the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and it's just a statement. Or you have some more detail concerning the Ajuj and Ajuj and some of the other signs. But there is nothing like the detail that we have about the Dajjal. Why? Because of the severity of this trial and this punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet wasallam said to the companions that the Dajjal will come and he will stay his reign upon earth will be 40 days. A day the length of a year. And a day the length of a month. And a day the length of a week. And then all of the other days will be normal days. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned many other things concerning the Dajjal, his punishment, his trials, and everything else. The companions of Allah, it is only reported to the best of my knowledge that they only asked a single question concerning the Dajjal. For more of the trials that he will bring, all of the powers that Allah will give to him, all of the abilities that he will have, they only ever asked about one question. That question wasn't about military warfare, it wasn't about strategies and tactics. It wasn't about, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what weapons shall we build? What fortresses shall we build? How shall we kill him? What shall we do? They only asked about one question. What was that? Salah. O oh, Messenger of Allah, how do we pray during those days? If a day is the length of a year, or the length of a month, or a week, how do we pray? Isn't that amazing? From all of the questions you could have asked the Prophet and many of us wouldn't ask just one, we wouldn't ask hundreds. We'd have books of questions, lists, every prayer, every prayer. Shaykh, I have another question. Oh, Messiah of Allah, I have another question. Yet the <laughs> companions only ever ask one. Just one. Oh, Messiah of Allah, how do we pray? So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, estimate the timings of the prayer. Doesn't this show the philosophy of the companions, the mentality, the outlook? Doesn't it show the way the Prophet ﷺ nurtured his companions, the understanding that they had that was so deep of the religion? That it doesn't matter about tactics, doesn't matter about warfare, doesn't matter about any of those other things. If your relationship with Allah is weak, then even the smallest trial will take you away. It will wipe you out. And if your Iman is strong, then it doesn't matter how great the trial is. You will be steadfast by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The companions understood this. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a man by the name of Ibn Sayyad. 
and they thought, some of the companions thought that this man may be the Dajjal. He may be living in their midst. So they said to the Messenger of Allah, O Messenger of Allah, shall we not kill him? So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he is the Dajjal, you cannot kill him. And if he is not the Dajjal, then there is no benefit to kill him. Why can't they kill him if he's the Dajjal? Because only Isa alayhi salam will kill the Dajjal. They understood the way the Prophet is teaching them a principle. And then even though they suspected this man of being the Dajjal, you don't find the companions were preoccupied with him. You don't find narrations revolving around him. You don't find tens upon tens or hundreds upon hundreds of hadith about this man. You forgot about him. Why? Because it doesn't matter if he's alive, he's dead, he's here, he's there, maybe it doesn't matter. If your relationship with Allah Azzawajal isn't strong, then nothing else is significant. And if your relationship with Allah Azzawajal is strong, and it is firm, and it is steadfast, then everything else is insignificant to you anyway. It pales in significance. And that's why the companions, radiallahu anhum, and before them the prophets of Allah Azzawajal, despite the difficulties and the hardships and the tests that they faced, it was their strong iman which helped them, which saw them through it. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ in the early years of Mecca, all he did was work on the Iman of the companion. He established it, made it strong, fortified it, worked on their hearts, worked on their relationship with Allah, worked on their brotherhood with one another, the way they were as a community. And then they were ready. Yet today we do things the other way around. We don't have a solid foundation. We don't know our religion. We don't understand the Quran. We don't understand what Allah Azza wa wants from us. We pray, we listen to the Qur'an, but we don't really have a connection with Allah Azza wa Jal through these acts of worship. And so these are the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyam. And as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that tattabi'unna sunana man kana qabla. And you will follow the ways of those who came before you. This happened in every nation with every Prophet that after they died, over time they would lose that connection with Allah. And they would become more materialistic. And all of the evil that their Prophets warned them against, they became rampant within their community. And so as a result, they became weak. Weak in their Iman. Weak in their knowledge of their religion. And that's where innovations became widespread. Until people can't differentiate between Halal and Haram. Between Sunnah and Bid'ah. Between what is Tawheed and what is Shirk. People don't know even what their religion is. And so they become distanced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the most important lesson that we can take from studying the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah to study them is extremely important. And it is from the articles of faith to learn about this. But it is there as a reminder. It is there so that you take these benefits and you adopt them, you apply them in your life. And you safeguard yourself from the trends and patterns that will occur around you. And so we have knowledge, we have worship, we have wealth, we have leadership, we have social issues, all of these things are mentioned within the signs of Yom Al-Qiyam. And they will culminate into the major sign. But before that, for us and our families and our communities, we need to work to safeguard ourselves from this. So that we can strengthen our connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we can learn about Allah Azza wa Jal. The final thing that I will say, and I leave you with this, is I advise you, if you want like a, something easy to, to, to learn about and to understand this, is to go back to Surah al -Dahm. Because the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam highlighted Surah Al-Dahf is the one Surah that saves you from the Dajjal. And the reason why he said that the Dajjal is the greatest sign that will ever come is because all of these things that I, would, uh, that I have been speaking about, all of them will be brought by the Dajjal. He will have trials in wealth, trials in worship, trials of knowledge, trials of power, trials of social issues, trials of arrogance. All of these things will be brought by the Dajjal. He will bring them in many ways, shapes and forms. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, learn Surah al -Dahab. Because Surah al -Dahab is a surah that teaches you how to safeguard yourself from the evils of all of these trials. And the stories of Surah al -Dahab teach you how to safeguard yourself from the trials of wealth, and the trials of knowledge, and the trials of power and leadership and arrogance. And all of these things are mentioned within the stories you find within Surah al -Dahab. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grants you and your community success that Allah Azza wa Jal keeps us all steadfast upon this religion, that He showers His mercy and blessings upon us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from amongst those who don't just listen to these reminders, but we understand them and we comprehend over them and we apply them in our lives. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that he allows us to be resurrected in the company of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters us into the highest ranks of Jannah. That Allah is and safeguards us and our families and our children from all that is evil and is harmful. Jazakum wa khairan. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.